Okay, let's go ahead and get started so we can make sure to get through everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon, not afternoon, morning session. Um, my name is Carolina Nobre. I am an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, and I am psyched to be the chair session for this set of papers today. We have a lot of really exciting talks coming up. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, our first talk is a survey of perception-based visualization studies by task by Ghulam Quadri. So Ghulam, go ahead, take it away. We have observed a notable increase in perception-based visualization studies over recent years. Despite of so many studies, there is a gap in understanding of, and synthesis of those results in terms of visualization design, effectiveness, and recommendation. Today, we are going to talk about how we can synthesize conducted research finding that will advance the research enabling an optimized visualization design. Hello everyone, I'm Ghulam, currently a CI Fellow postdoc at UNC Chapel Hill, working with Daniel Safer, and this work was conducted with, in collaboration with my PhD advisor, Paul Rosen, at the University of South Florida. Now the lab moved to University of Utah. In recent years, visualization rely on from visual perception to drive design guidelines. However, even these studies can take a number of different forms making challenging to synthesize across results from different studies. While relying on knowledge from visual perception has been successful, recent work in visualization has shown a lot of limitations of bringing these results into visualization without considering the complexities challenges that introduce. Graphical perception studies instead explore perception within the context of visualization use. However, even these studies can take a number of different forms of objectives and myth and analysis, making challenging to synthesize across results from each of these individual studies. For example, each of these experiments has been conducted in different goals, methods, and analysis. Additionally, graphical perception studied here is in individual spaces of visualization types, visual encoding, or visual tasks. Back to the question again. With all this recent progress, how should we study these perception-related work in context of effectiveness at the intersection of visualization types, visual tasks, and visual encoding? I will talk about this work in four sections as outlined, starting with the method. We identified 122 perception-focused papers from visualizations, HCI, and other related venues. We summarize their research development in curated practical taxonomy of perception-focused studies on low-level tasks, further breaking techniques down by visual encoding and visualizations. Further, we summarize the number of studies we reviewed per task, visual encoding, and the visualization types. We find a lot of patterns here in the summary. How can we use the taxonomy to make sense of those patterns? The table reveals which area have received most attentions and those that need more work. As we can see, certain tasks and visualization types are overrepresented. For example, scatter plot, bar, and line graph have high representation among all the graph types. The high represented examples are the groups that have been exten extensively studied, and we as a community know well about them through our prior work. Similarly, for tasks, retrieving a value or computation of derived values captured more attentions from researchers in their evaluation studies. Who can benefit with our survey? This report targets students, practitioners, and researchers. Each of them will find values in different sections. Our survey and taxonomy will help beginner research, visualization researchers and learn perception-based studies in a contextualized format. The limitation open research questions section will be valuable if you're looking for new research ideas. Our survey will help conduct a background study on perception-based visualization research. Now let's see how to use this taxonomy to find individual studies. The taxonomy is discussed in section three of our paper, where each of the 11 tasks summarizes experiments and findings on visual coding and types of visualizations. For example, 
correlation task, which is further subsection into visual encoding and subsequently on visualization type, such as scatter plot. Each subsection discusses the experiments and findings as filtered paper in their respective context. Now let's delve into the taxon insights we will learn from this taxonomy. Due to time limitation, I will discuss a few of them. Please read through our paper for more detail. One of the important conclusions we have seen is that low-level task effectiveness varies with data set at hand, the visualizations used, and a specific design variation within that visualization. Some visualization types tend to perform better than others, but from our observation, we deduce there is no single visualization that is suitable for all situations. Saket et al. conducted a study to investigate the task-based effectiveness of five visualization types on small data sets using 10 low-level tasks on three measures, accuracy, time completion, and subject preference. They seem to agree with our conclusion from survey when they stated no one size fits all. In other words, depending upon the task at hand, various visualizations can perform better or worse. Even within a single visualization type, design variations can have serious effect on the performance. But how much progress have we made here in the space of graphical perception study? We witnessed the continuously evolving nature of perceptual research, with the majority focusing on visual task judgment. The recent upward trend supported by two recent star reports showing the maturity of this area of research. As the research objective and methodologies have evolved, insights have become more fine-grained and nuanced. For example, Chung et al. observed that color saturation with size could be used as an ordering, ordering variable. Similarly, Safir's work measured perceptual judgment on color difference that varies with size encodings. For example, bar width, circle radius, and line width. These innovations, while enlightening, also stand somewhat in contrast with applied works. For example, Collins' Weir book on visualization design and perception, which also provides a practical view of effective design. Our investigation led us to experiments that have limited its scope. For example, focus on a small set of visual encoding, types of visualizations, limited tasks, and limited data size and variety. Furthermore, most findings are never replicated or externally validated beyond peer review, with only a few exceptions. This all puts the reproducibility of results on a tenuous footing. For example, if the real-world condition associated with data visualization do not match a contrived scenario, often necessarily for graphical perception, will the findings be still relevant? Many research studies in visualization are driven by popularity, familiarity, and applications. For example, Scatter plot, line graph, and bar graph received higher attentions as compared to those of lower representation, represented visualization types. While it is unlikely that distribution of studies will balance out, insights gained from some of the less frequently studied techniques can have significant value. As Ron said, scatter plot is a fruit fly. We have opportunities now to study more complex organisms. Through our taxonomy, we wanted to emphasize perception-based research findings and their impact on visual encoding and visualization choices. Research on design recommendation focuses on effective visualization design that depends on visual channels used, chart types, or visual tasks, but independently. Visualization effectiveness in terms of visualization design choice and task helps the analyst make sense of the data set at hand. Additionally, we evolved through the time and made excellent progress using graphical perceptions. At the same time, limitation in the experiment data collections and availability limit the scope and reproducibility. We have developed a web resource as an interactive list of all the papers we have identified and reviewed in our survey. The interactive web resource can be utilized to identify and filter selected perception-based studies on visualization types, encodings, visual tasks, authors, and venue. Please check this interactive web resource. Thank you for coming and listening to my talk. I'm currently on the job market. Please reach out to me if you or your university has any opening. Now I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you again.
Thank you. And I see a couple of questions on Slido. I do want to take this opportunity to remind you that if you do have questions, the Slido room is Oklahoma Station 6. This is a joint 6, 7, and 8 kind of talk, but the Slido question should be in 6. Okay, so we have here, um, the question is, so this search tool in taxonomy seems very useful. That was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Going forward, do you have plans to keep this search tool updated, right, as we get new tools and new visualization designs, and how do you see that fitting into? Thank you. I guess yeah. the first part. Just that it's very useful and it was a great talk. The second part being that do you have plans to keep the, the taxonomy and the search tool updated as new studies come out? Yes, thank you. That's, um, yes, that's our plan. Every few years we plan to uh, identify and search those papers and keep adding. For example, we have another uh, Viz Perception uh, papers at Viz X Vision uh, uh, website. We plan also to do a search with our inclusion exclusion criteria and identify and use the taxonomy to divide the papers into visualization types, text, uh, encoding and task, and add to the uh, you know, uh, interactive paper list. Oh, there you go. Thanks. Um, and the other question was, you presented the statistics for various viz types. Do you think that there should be another level of taxonomy depending on the kind of data? So the example they gave is bar charts and line charts are for univariate data, right? And, and scatter, for scatter plots, PCP for multivariate data. Lots of people are still here. Sorry, say that again? There's lots of people coming from the back. Yes, so you presented the statistics for various different viz types, but do you think that there should be another level of this taxonomy depending on what kind of data you're looking at? Like bar charts and line charts are for univariate data. What about for BCP for multivariate data? Yes, that's a really great question. In our paper, we, uh, that is one of the things which we have not considered is what type of data they are considering, they are studying in the study. But that is the one thing we will surely consider in the future works as this area of the work is currently uh, in expanding, working on, for example, one of the papers from uh, Lionel Battle, which is uh, mentioning again in the similar uh, space on recommending visualization design based upon the effectiveness. So that's also we are planning to you know, expand the study based upon data sets and based upon the different types of methodology and measures they use in the perception-based studies. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gulam. Let's give our speaker a round of applause. OK, next up, we have Ting Ying He, who will be presenting BOVIS, a validated scale for measuring the aesthetic pleasure of visual representations. everyone, I'm Ting Ying He. Today, I will present our joint work on development and validation of BOVIS, a validated scale for measuring the aesthetic pleasure of visual data representations. Aesthetics is an elusive concept and a vast research field that is related to beauty and its appreciation. Aesthetic pleasure is a concept in aesthetics. In past research, the term aesthetic pleasure was used interchangeably with the term beauty. For example, Reber et al. defined beauty as a pleasurable subjective experience that is directed toward an object and not mediated by intervening reasoning and equated to the concept of aesthetic pleasure. In our work, we adopted this definition since it fits well with how many researchers approach these concepts in the visualization field. And accordingly, we use the term aesthetic pleasure and beauty interchangeably. In visualization research, the study of aesthetics mostly focuses on the visualization's visual appeal or beauty. It describes a property that is separated from how understandable, informative, or memorable the visual data representation is. Therefore, when we assess a visual visualization's aesthetic pleasure, we do not need to understand its meaning or know its data. Aesthetic pleasure has been suggested to affect the usability and effectiveness of visualization and has the potential to communicate and to engage viewers. It has also been identified as one of the heuristics of some subfields of visualization, for example, ambi ambient visualization. Therefore, it is important to study the aesthetic pleasure of visualization. 
However, when researchers want to measure the aesthetic pleasure of a visualization, which method can they use? In other fields, researchers have developed rating scales to study the aesthetic pleasure. Rating scales are measurement instruments to capture the underlying phenomenon, which is hard to observe by direct means. We also call this online phenomenon we want to capture as the construct of the scale. The construct can be caused by one factor or multiple factors. Each factor includes a group of items. All of these items will later combine into a composite score to indicate the level of the construct. In the human-computer interaction field, there exists several validated scales for measuring the aesthetic pleasure of websites or design artifacts. There also exist some user experience questionnaires that include factors that are related to aesthetic pleasure. However, there exists no validated scale targeted for measuring the aesthetic pleasure of visualization. Some researchers may use the scales in other fields, but we lack validation to know whether these scales are still reliable to study the aesthetic pleasure of visualization specifically, or different terms or new terms are required. One common solution visualization, re, visualization researchers adopted was to pick their own terms. They asked participants to read their visualization according to these terms. For example, how aesthetics or how enjoyable the visualization is. Unfortunately, without the validation, we cannot be certain that the results from these terms are reliable and valid to understand aesthetic pleasure of visualization. To solve this problem, we developed and validated a scale specifically for measuring the aesthetic pleasure of visualization. We call it the Bovid scale. To create this scale and to ensure that it produces reliable results, we went through a number of different steps. We began our research by investigating past 3,189 visualization publications for the terms they use in some form of aesthetics ratings in the evaluation of the visualization techniques or tools, and we collected terms from 68 papers. We also checked the literature in other related fields for the terms they use in the aesthetics-related uh, scale development, and we collected these terms as an additional input. As a final source of candidate terms, we invited 57 visualization experts to participate in a survey. In this survey, we asked the experts for terms they suggest for investigating people's subjective opinions of, of aesthetics or for visualization and we got a response from 31 uh, experts. Through this term generation step, we got a list of 209 terms. Then we narrowed down this list of terms based on six objective criteria. And again, we asked 56 visualization experts to read how important these terms was for studying the aesthetic pleasure of visualization. And we got a response from 25 experts. Through this term filling process, we narrowed down this list of terms to 31. Then we used these 31 terms in a crowdsource experiment with 1,001 participants and 15 data representations. We asked each participant to read three data representations randomly selected out of the 15. We wanted the data representations we selected to cover a wide variety of areas of visualization work and different, different approaches of visualization design, such as 2D versus 3D, black background versus white background, abstract versus physical content, handcrafted versus computer-generated aesthetic, and black and white versus colorful. With the result from this experiment, we conducted exploratory factor analysis to explore the underlying factor structure of the construct and to reduce terms. We extracted one factor based on the script plot. Then we reduced the terms based on factor loadings. The table of factor loadings per term is an important output of the exploratory factor analysis. The higher the factor loading a term has, the better this term is able to describe the construct and in our case, aesthetic pleasure. 
since the fact loading greater than 0.7 are considered high values. We returned 12 uh, terms which had a factor loading above 0.7 for all 15 images. Then we collated the reliability of scales constructed through these 12 remaining terms. Since scales with the Kronbach alpha greater than 0.7 are considered reliable. According to our analysis, the best three, four, five item subset would all produce reliable results. Nonetheless, we recommend using the five item version for its even higher reliability and because it can still be completed quickly by participants. Based on this analysis, we arrived at our final Bovis scale. It consists of only one factor, aesthetic pleasure, and five items, enjoyable, likable, pleasing, nice, and appealing. Finally, we conducted another crowdsource experiment to validate our final skill with 201 participants and three data representations. These three data representations had been assessed for aesthetic pleasure in a previous study. Among them, the sunburst was the most beautiful one, and the beam tree was the most ugly one. From our scale, we can see the rating of these three data representations were ranked from samples to beam tree, which replicated the result in the previous study. We also conducted the confirmatory factor analyze to confirm the one factor structure of our scale. And we evaluated the reliability and the validity of our scale. So the Bovis scale provides a simple instrument to rapidly compare the different uh, visualizations aesthetic pleasure. And we recommend you to use it in the same way as we did in our experiments. We also recommend to use the Bovis scale accompanied with other evaluation methods, such as interview or controlled experiments for indication of the aesthetic pleasure of a visual data representation. Um, that's, all, that's all what I want to share today about my project. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Tingying. We have two really interesting questions here on Slido. The first is, um, this study focuses on stationary visualizations, right? Do you think that this scale also, how would this scale work for potentially interactive, um, animated visualizations? Do you think that potentially there would be other terms that you should consider? Do you think it, it kind of um, generalizes well to those types of visualizations? Um, um, that's a very interesting question. Um, when we validated our scale, uh, we asked the participants to read the visualization without interact, interact with them and without un to understand their data. So that means we captured the first impression uh, of people, uh, from people towards the visualizations. Thus, I think um, our scale may also ap applicable to the visualization with motion or animation. However, if you want to know the aesthetic feeling during the interactive process, I think we need further research on other terms maybe. Yeah. OK, great. And I have two other questions, so hopefully we'll be quick enough that I can squeeze them both in. The first is, can you comment on the potential biasing effect of the fact that all of your scale terms are very positive, right? And so in connotation that some visualizations potentially center on negative topics, and so not confounding um, those two things? Um, uh, we, we intend to um, uh, choose the positive um, terms. Uh, because in this way, the score uh, can, can be um, uh, easily to compare. If there are terms that are not clearly positive or negative, um, the, the score can, it will be hard to compare, I think. OK, great. And the last one is, did you compare this five item scale to the same conditions, but for a simple singular question on aesthetic pleasure? So you know how the idea of this scale is to break out just not did you like it, but what are the aspects that you liked about it? Um, did you compare a single question to your five item uh, scale? Um, I didn't do this by myself, but there are literature uh, to say that the single item questions are not reliable. Yeah, so uh, to capture a construct, uh, we need at least like three items that would be at the most uh, list. Yes. Fantastic, thank you. Let's thank our speaker.
Okay, next up we have Laura South presenting on photosensitive accessibility for interactive data visualizations. Okay, great, sorry. I feel like you guys can't really see me. Under This podium is very tall. Um, <laughs> I am here, I promise. Um, great, um, yeah, so as she said, I'm Laura South, and today I'm presenting a paper called Photosensitive Accessibility for Interactive Data Visualizations that I co-wrote with my advisor, Michelle Borkin, at Northeastern University. Now, as everyone in this room probably knows, interaction is kind of a crucial component of modern visualization design. It enables users to efficiently explore huge data sets and uncover insights and have more control over their experience. But at the same time, those visual changes that are triggered by user interaction can sometimes produce these flickering light sequences and sudden color changes that can actually be harmful if they're viewed by someone with photosensitive epilepsy. And now, photosensitive epilepsy, for anyone who's not aware, is a neurological condition that's characterized by recurrent seizures in response to light stimuli that affects approximately 9.1 million people worldwide. And the internet and navigating online spaces can be something that's really dangerous, risky, and challenging for someone who has photosensitive epilepsy, as um, content with flickering lights and strobes can occur in basically any kind of media um, that you can think of. So here I have some examples of YouTube videos, GIFs posted to social media, um, virtual reality platforms, um, that all are instances where people, in, uh, people with photosensitive epilepsy had seizures or had face some kind of risk upon encountering this content. And um, photosensitive accessibility, which is what I'm talking about here, is a specialized area of accessibility research that's focused on ensuring that digital and online content is not capable of producing these seizure-inducing light sequences. And this is an active field of research with recent works investigating methods for detecting and removing seizure-inducing content from videos and GIFs. And the detrimental and even deadly consequences of having a seizure make this work that has really high potential in improving the daily lives and the safety of people who have photosensitive epilepsy. But the concept of photosensitive accessibility has not really been considered within the field of data visualization, even despite recent efforts to talk about accessibility within data viz. So today in this work, I'm examining the question of measuring and ensuring photosensitive safety and accessibility within the context of interactive data visualizations, which is obviously a, an area where these eye-grabbing visual cues are really important and used to draw attention and convey meaning. So here I have a list of the contributions of this work, and um, unfortunately due to time, I'm only gonna be able to talk about the second, they're the last two contributions, which are an extension of the theoretical model of what photosensitive risk means in interactive data visualizations, which builds off prior work for static media, and additionally a novel method for testing accessibility of color palettes um, in interactive visualizations. But I recommend, or, and I encourage anyone to check out our paper for more information on the rest of our contributions and our software and data artifacts. So now getting back to our research question, um, how would we know if this interactive data visualization is photosensitive accessible? This is kind of what we want, our main central question of this work. It's a very simple interactive data visualization that probably many people have seen before. Now, when the traditional method of examining whether something is photosensitive safe or not involves running a screen recording of it through uh, risk detection software and producing either a safe or a dangerous label. But when we think about uh, data visualizations, how can we be sure that a visualization wouldn't get a different result if it's being used by a different user? Perhaps a user who has a tremor or a user who interacts more quickly with the visualization elements. Like here we can see three hypothetical different users interacting with the same visualization. And now if we use the same approach that um, is used for other kinds of content, we might get different, um, uh, different safety, safety labels based on that method. And so that leads to sort of some confusion about how do we know if something is actually photosensitive safe or not. So basically we need a different method that's more uh, suited to the specifics of interactive data visualization. And this lack of reliability in testing screen recordings of interactive visualizations is essentially a result of limited authorial control over what is shown to the user when they interact with the system. 
In other words, a designer can implement a visualization with specific interactions, but ultimately they don't have complete control over what precisely is shown to the user in terms of visual stimuli because of the uh, interaction methods that may, may be different. Sorry. Um, and this is in stark contrast to other media types that are often tested for photosensitive accessibility, which are static and therefore do not depend on the individual user, such as videos and GIFs. So now let's take a closer look at photosensitive risk and data visualizations and specifically the theoretical model that is sort of the heart of this paper that I'm talking about today. And so we can start by examining a widely accepted three determinant model of photosensitive risk that's used in web content accessibility guidelines to define seizure inducing flashes in static media. So first, let's talk about some terminology. In this work, when we use the word flash, we're talking about a single change in luminance. And when we talk about flicker, we're talking about a series of flashes. And there are two common ways that flicker can occur in a data visualization. The first we call uh, in this work an internal element flicker. And that's simply when an element changes color in response to interaction. So in this example, we can see it's a map of Canada and the provinces change color to indicate the user's current selection. But we can also have a second type of flicker, which we call adjacent element flicker. And this is produced when the foreground and background elements rapidly alternate occupying the same portion of the screen. So a flickering effect is produced here, even though um, no elements are explicitly changing color in response to user interaction. So now we have these two definitions of flickers, but how do we know whether a given flicker may be seizure inducing or not? So here we get to the three determinant model. So we have three characteristics that together determine whether something should be considered a photosensitive risk. And these are size, frequency, and color. And essentially, um, each of these characteristics has a specific threshold, and this is all coming from neurology research, which I did not define, but you can see our paper for more details. And essentially, all three of these thresholds must be exceeded for content to be considered seizure inducing. So now let's look at how the size threshold manifests in an interactive data visualization. In general, the more area occupied by a flicker, the more likely it is to be seizure inducing, assuming the other two thresholds are also exceeded. And now visualization designers can set the initial size of elements and they can define specific interactions that might change the size of the elements, but the user also is able to externally, outside of the implementation, change the size of elements. Like here we can see the user is zooming in the browser to change it. So essentially, the creator does not have complete control over what the size of the elements are, so there's low authorial control in our model for size, for the size threshold. And now we have the frequency threshold, which um, uh, the higher, the more flashes per second indicates it's going to be more likely to be seizure inducing. And um, here the author has a moderate amount of control over uh, the frequency threshold because you can implement gradual transitions that ease between color changes. So there's moderate authorial control over the frequency threshold. And then with the color threshold, um, here we actually have a high degree of control because in general, the user cannot manually control the colors being shown in a visualization. So if the visualization creator um, chooses specific colors, those are generally the colors that the end user is actually going to be seen. So importantly, we have high authorial control over the color threshold when it comes to photosensitive accessibility. So now to do a quick wrap up, um, we extended the prior theoretical model of photosensitive risk that was created to test static media, which is based on size, frequency, and color. And we identified that within interactive visualizations, there are varying levels of authorial control, which are low authorial control for size, moderate authorial control for frequency, and high authorial control for color. And now we can use this updated model to develop new methods for ensuring photosensitive safety within interactive data visualizations that is more robust to these variations in interaction style between users that we identified at the beginning of this talk. Specifically, we can do this by focusing on frequency and color, which have some degree of authorial control over whether the threshold is respected or not. So first, let's talk about the frequency threshold. And this is actually uh, fairly straightforward to um, uh, uphold within data visualizations because uh, transitions are often, um, they're implemented directly in a lot of uh, visualization, langu visualization languages and libraries, which makes it relatively straightforward to attach a transition with the duration of at least approximately 350 milliseconds to ensure that um, no more than three flashes occur per second. So that's a relatively straightforward method, but unfortunately, Transitions might not be applicable in every single scenario, so we also want to look at the color threshold. And now, ensuring the color threshold is not exceeded when designing interactive visualizations is a little bit more complicated because no tools currently exist to allow designers to examine the photosensitive risk of a given color scheme. 
So that means a hypothetical designer would have to manually check the relative luminances of the colors involved in all possible um, element flickers that we talked about before. And this is extremely tedious and there's lots of room for error. So in this um, paper, we also uh, propose a new method for directly testing the photosensitive accessibility of color palettes in these interactive data visualizations. And I don't have too much time to get super into it, but um, I encourage you to check out our paper. Essentially, it involves three steps for this uh, example visualization. We first identify the colors, which we can see here. And then we assign roles. So here we have three initial fill colors. We have one color that is used to indicate selection or focus. And then finally, we have a background color. And through the prototype system that we contribute in this paper, we can actually um, produce a JSON specification of all of the colors and their roles in the visualization, and then produce this accessibility assessment, um, which indicates um, which of the flickers could be potentially hazardous for someone with photosensitivity. And then as a bonus, we can also check the contrast of um, the given colors to make sure that they're also accessible for people with low vision at the same time. So to sum up, in this work, we explored the meaning of accessibility for people with photosensitive epilepsy um, within interactive data visualizations, and we updated an existing model of photosensitive risks to be more applicable to interactive visualizations. And then finally, we used that model to create a prototype system for reliably assessing photosensitive risk in interactive charts based on color choices. And um, I just want to say accessibility research is still a little bit nascent in the Viz community, and we really look forward to further discussion about this work and how we can move towards broader definitions of accessibility in our community. Thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Laura. So we have a, the top voted question here, which I also thought was very interesting. Do you think that techniques of visual foreshadowing for interactive changes can help deal with the issue of that lag that you get when you have to maintain like that transition time between when you mouse over and it actually um, changes color? Do you think some kind of visual foreshadowing could help with that? Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a really good example where, of where um, maybe traditional viz research and viz perception research can really help with this because that's almost like, like a, a whole separate, like it does that help with um, making it easier for us to have these gradual transitions. Like we do need additional viz research to support, making, like to make it easier for us to have these accessible versions of visualizations while still maintaining, you know, the effectiveness and the utility of the visualization tools while also being accessible. So yeah, I think that's a really, really great idea. Um, and yeah, I hadn't thought about that before, but it's a really good idea. Awesome. And then the other thing is, can you talk a little bit about how potentially the device used would affect this photosensitive accessibility? Is it mobile? Is it desktop? Right? A lot of your examples, yeah, are, you know, you mouse over that. On your phone, you're much less likely to accidentally create that experience. Yeah, yeah, so that's actually really interesting. So um, the main difference that device, uh, the main effect that device has on whether something is seizure inducing or not is actually really closely tied to that size threshold that I mentioned. So um, because it's not actually based on the amount of screen real estate, it's really about the uh, amount of your retina that's stimulated by the strobing sequence. And so that is also a function of how close the device is to your face and also the size of the screen. Um, so actually, you could maybe make the argument that based on what I, the model that I proposed, size isn't really something we should be basing our safety guidelines on anyways in DataViz, just because our work is so um, flexible in terms of the size of visual elements. It's not really something you can depend on. So um, yes, it would impact it, but I don't think it really would affect this model because we're already sort of not relying on the size threshold to begin with. Awesome, and I do wanna ask one last quick question here, which I think is um, something related to what we've talked about, which is this idea of, for example, with colors, even though low relative change in luminance can resolve the app, this issue with photosensitive accessibilities, then you have people with color blindness, right? And then they depend on those tonal differences to be actually be able to see how do you really navigate these conflicting needs in your design recommendations? Yeah, yeah, that's what, uh, I think that's one of the most interesting things to think about in response to this work. And I would say, I think that there's a lot of power in, let me just go back to this here, having these uh, tools that allow us to simultaneously see like accessibility audits for different needs and like very gradually find that middle ground if it exists, you know, because in this case, 
when you play with this tool, you, you can find those cases uh, most of the time where it does satisfy your contrast needs and your photosensitive accessibility needs. But it is, it's a very, it's a, it's a very touchy thing and you do have to be very careful. But I think there's a lot of power in developing these methods that consider all of the different accessibility needs or as many as possible at the same time. So a designer isn't um, only thinking in one context of accessibility. They can see both of them simultaneously. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. Let's thank our speaker. Okay, next up we have Melissa Shaneline talking about the unifying effects of direct and relational associations for visual communication. So say I present this visualization about continuous data and ask for there are more CO2 emissions. We know from past work that people are influenced by various relational associations when interpreting color maps, including the dark is more biased, which is the inference that darker colors, that darker colors represent more even when legends are present. So here inferring that darker colored red regions produce more CO2 than lighter colored regions. The dark is more bias is one of several relational associations, but today we'll focus on just the dark is more bias. Now instead, here's a visualization about sources of electricity. Past work on visualizations of categorical information suggests people are influenced by direct color concept associations, or the degree to which each color is associated with each concept. So given that coal is often associated with darker blacks and browns, it's easy to infer this large brown section might represent coal. And similarly, given associations of water with various blues, we can easily infer this light blue strip for hydroelectricity. So there are these different kinds of visualizations representing continuous versus categorical data in different factors that have been previously studied separately for each. In the present work, we demonstrate that the factors influencing these interpretations are not quite so distinct and can be understood under a single framework of assignment inference. So assignment inference is the process by which people infer mappings among visual features and concepts in encoding systems. It's similar to an assignment problem in optimization, which is a model for assigning items in one set to items in another in a manner that maximizes or optimizes the merit of the pairs. Now, merit is the goodness of the assignments. So say we have the concepts trash and paper and two bins for disposing those materials. To simulate assignment inference, we start by creating a bipartite graph to represent those concepts and colors. The edges represent the relationship, um, in which case is merit here, and we can think about that as the direct associations. So in this trial, trash is more associated with white than with purple. However, the mapping that is optimizing the goodness is to put trash in purple and paper in white, which is what participants do. And so we can identify this optimal mapping by taking the sum of the outer edges and comparing it with the sum of the inner edges. The larger value is the optimal mapping. So again, in this case, putting trash in purple. So the question that emerges of if this framework of assignment inference can extend to visualizations of continuous data. So here's how we defined merit for the dark is more biased using an example color map, which for now we'll say represents some concept X. So with continuous data, we're working with gradations of quantities and gradations of colors. To map these two sets to one another, we have a lot of options, but there's only two that maintain structure preservation, which is when the natural orderings of gradations are maintained. So maintaining the sequence of lightness to the sequence of numbers. So one structure preserving mapping is when large numbers map to darker colors, and the other is when large numbers map to lighter colors. So then to account for the dark is more biased, we give more weight to the dark more mapping. And for the purpose of the present work, we assume that lightness varies monotonically, such that we can reduce the assignment problem to just the endpoints, like we discussed earlier for direct associations with categorical data. And to make this more fully complete, the color map was generated from a color scale of 10 steps rather than four. Now, in simulating assignment inference for a source of merit, we also need to consider the semantic discriminability of the colors and concepts, which is the ability to distinguish between the meanings of the different colors in an encoding system. So maybe it's helpful to think about this with respect to perceptual discriminability, so seeing the difference between colors. Here we're talking about the difference in the meanings of the colors. So previous work operationalized semantic discriminability with a metric called semantic distance, which measures the degree to which one assignment is better than the other from zero to one. So for our example, bipartite graph for our concept X in which we're looking at the dark is more biased for the source of merit, the semantic distance here is really high, meaning one assignment is much better than the other. In the present work, we extended this to create signed semantic distance, which accounts for which assignment is actually the better one. So the dark's more bias always suggests the dark more mapping, um, so in this case, the outer assignment, and so we'll give that a positive value. 
And if we turn now to direct associations for continuous data, the ideas we just discussed all apply here as well, including assumptions about monotonicity, except now merit is direct associations. Again, we can calculate semantic distance, which again here in this case is large, and with the dark more mapping as being optimal. So now we can define merit for direct and relational associations. How can we think about combining merit from these different sources? So here's that example color map, but now concept X is actually ocean water. So you can imagine I asked participants to indicate where they think there's more ocean water, on the left or the right side. So there's different possible sources of merit that we think will influence participants. So again, we just discussed, in this case, the optimal mapping according to direct associations is a dark more mapping, which is also the prediction for a dark is more bias. So in this case, they're consistent with one another. And so we can use the weighted sum, where the Ws are the weight, to combine each source into a combined merit, which we then can calculate that semantic distance value over to evaluate the relative contributions of each source. Now, for some color maps, like this one, the sources make conflicting predictions. So merit from direct associations suggests a light more assignment. And again, dark is more biased suggests that dark more assignment. But we can use that um, weighted sum to calculate our combined merit and evaluate the relative contributions. So in this study, we tested whether direct and relational associations both contribute to merit for color map visualizations, and if so, what are the relative weights of each source? We tested this across three experiments, but today I'll focus on just the third. So to do this, first we collected color concept association ratings data by asking participants to indicate how much they associate a given color with a given concept on a scale from not at all to very much. They made these judgments for 71 different colors from the UW71 set. And using those associations, we generated color scales which we then used to generate color maps to measure inferred mappings. So in our color maps, one side was biased to be dark, the other was biased to be light. Participants saw 10 of these different maps for a given color scale and were asked to indicate which side they thought had more of the given concept. And so we calculate then the mean proportion of times participants select the darker side. And that's the value then we want to try to predict from simulations of assignment inference from multiple sources of merit. So when we created these color scales using the association ratings seen on the left, we had a couple criteria. So for each of our concepts, we wanted color scales in which the darker endpoint was highly associated with the concept. So in this color scale we've been working with, so the dark blue is highly associated with ocean water. And so in these cases, the sources of merit are consistent. So both dark is more bias and direct association suggest a dark more mapping. On the other end, we have cases in which the lighter endpoint is more associated, which results in conflicting sources of merit. So the direct association says a light more mapping, dark is more bias, says dark more. And in the middle, we have cases in which both endpoints are similarly associated. So from direct associations, neither assignment is necessarily that much better than the other. So we selected 21 color scales that fit this criteria for each of our concepts, which resulted in 63 color scales fully between subjects. So now to get this question of what are the relative weights um, in this combined merit, we assigned each source a weight, and we varied those in increments of 0.05 such that they sum to one. We multiply the relative weights onto the respective bipartite graph, and then sum the corresponding edges to create that combined merit graph. And then over combined merit, we calculate the sign semantic distance over this to then predict participants' responses. So, if we first take a look at a case in which all the weight is on direct associations, the dark more bias falls out, and we're left calculating sign semantic distance over just direct associations. We want to compare those predictions with the participants' actual responses. And so if we're doing a good job, our results should fall along this line. So here's the data point for color maps that look like this, and the prediction is quite good, meaning there's small error. And here's the rest of the color scales. The predictions are OK, but there's a number, that, a number of points that are above the line, which is probably due to the dark more bias prompting people to select the darker side. And so we quantify performance by taking the mean squared error and comparing it for each of the different relative weight pairings. So again, right now we're looking at when all the weights on direct associations, and we have an MSC of around 0.3. If we contrast this now with when all the weight is on the dark is more biased, so direct associations aren't relevant, the predictions we can see are not quite as good. They're always positive, given the dark is more biased, suggests people pick the darker side, but that's not how people behave. So we see a much larger mean squared error. Here then are the remaining MSEs for each of the relative weight pairs. And we found that the lowest MSE was when there was a weight of 0.3 on the dark is more biased and 0.7 on direct associations. And when we look at those predictions, we can see that they're clearly much better than the other ones we looked at. We found a similar pattern for the color scales for glacial ice and ocean water, and when we took the average across all three concepts. And so our overall best weight pair was when that weight was of 0.7 on direct associations and 0.3 on the darkest more bias. 
Now, we identified this best pair using responses from only half of our participants. And so with the held out group of participants, we tested whether that optimal weight pair was better than when the weight was on each source in isolation. So here's the MSE for when all the weight was on direct associations, when all the weight's on the dark more bias, and all the weight for, or when the weight was on from the optimal pair, which we can see was significantly better than when, each, when the weight was on each source in isolation. And so here we can also look at the sign semantic distance values, predicting the testing data's responses with this optimal weight pair. So we previously saw these semantic distances for ocean water with the training data, and here we can see now that there are good predictions as well for the testing data. For wildfire, the predictions are even better. And for glacial ice, they're a bit worse, which we believe is maybe due to some of these color scales in being influenced by the opaque is more bias, another relational association, which we're following up on. So, Previous work focused on investigating the sources of merit in assignment inference for visualizations of categorical data. Here, we extended assignment inference to visualizations of continuous data, and we demonstrate that both relational associations and direct associations are contributing to people's inferred mappings for color maps, which determine their interpretations. And so we have a couple open questions, including how to incorporate these additional sources of merit into this framework and what the relative weights would be and also questions about how to define merit for color scales that do not vary monotonically in association, such as when the middle color is the most associated, and also for color scales that have a neutral middle point, such as diverging scales. Together, though, this work can be translated into designing visualizations that align with people's expectations about the meanings of colors, thereby making visualizations that are easier to interpret. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. So he, our question here on Slido says that the demographics might really influence the nature of these direct associations, right? So how do you think your ratings are generalizable to, for example, non-native English speakers? Yeah, that's a great question. So the whole kind of premise of assignment inference is that this is a general process that regardless of kind of we, we think, it's an open question, of whether this process is um, general across people. And so the key feature, though, is the input into this, so those direct um, color concept associations. And so those are different, we know, across different cultures. And so the idea is that for the group of people that you're creating a visualization for, the key is having the right input, for, so having the right um, color concept associations to put into this process. Um, and so having... Um, the right group of people to give the associations to then create visualizations for is the kind of key. And the, the next question actually is related to this on the other side, instead of the people, the, the topic of the visualization, do you think that the effective intent of the visualization can interfere with the direct associations? And the example given here is of polarizing topics like climate change or COVID. Yeah, so I haven't thought too much about this, um, but this is an interesting question of you know, the, there's the colors that we might associate for the concepts themselves being represented, um, but there's also um, maybe embedded in that is we have different associations now with particular concepts because of um, our affective response to those concepts. And so maybe now I have, um, kind of early on in the pandemic, maybe I had certain associations for COVID-19, um, and as things progressed and got worse, those associations may be changed. Um, and so it might be the case that the, those different affective influences are embedded in those associations, um, but that's a great question, um, something to think more about. Thank you so much, Melissa. Let's uh, thank our speaker again while we get... Um Okay, next up we have Sungbok Shin presenting a scanner deeply, predicting gaze heat maps on visualizations using crowdsourced eye movement data. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Songbok Shin. I'm the presenter of the paper, A Scanner Deeply, Predicting Gaze Heat Maps on Visualizations Using Crowdsourced Eye Movement Data. Um, in doing this work, I was fortunate to work with uh, wonderful collaborators, Sung Hyo from Kakao Corp and Dr. Sung Hong from Oregon State. 
and Dr. Nicholas Emquist, who's my advisor. Um, so there are a lot of eye tracking studies, and eye tracking studies are useful for a lot of domains, and they're also useful for um, visualization studies. However, eye tracking studies can be burdensome in some cases because they can take a lot of time, um, it needs a lot of money, and we would need to recruit a lot of participants. So we thought about what if they, there could be a deep learning based virtual eye tracker for visualizations that is fast, uh, fastly provides output, and operates on a low cost budget, and also does not involve participants. And for that, uh, we developed a scanner deeply pipeline. And the scanner deeply pipeline works in the following manner. First, you retrieve a sizable amount of chart images. Then you collect eye movement data based on them. Then you train the model. Then you have their scanner deeply. However, to get to the point where you have the scanner deeply, you have some challenges. The problem, so the first challenge is that you need to obtain scalable quality data set and the second problem is that you need to develop an effective scanner deeply. And now, in the following slides, I want to talk more in detail about <clears throat> these two challenges. Um, first, for chart image collection, um, we were able to obtain around 10,000 chart images. We got them from Google Images using keyword search. And these keywords are from topics that are collected on academic papers. And we also had some constraints for our image, such as having one chart in an image, not having images that are too long or too wide in uh, their heights or width, and not having unreadably small text sizes. So we're also interested, actually, about the distribution of charts in the data set. So we sampled 1,000 of them, and we found out that 82.4% of them were bar, line, or pie charts. So we collected images, now we need to collect gaze. And for this, we had one mission. Oh. Yes. Our mission was to collect at least one gaze map per chart image. Now what you're seeing here is how we collected gaze maps uh, from participants. Now is the calibration phase. And once the we test the calibration, and if it's below 70%, they must do it again. So then we ask them to look at the chart for seven seconds. And after that, we ask them to answer the question. Um, in doing this, we used webgazer.js library to develop the interface. And this study is done on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Now, after what you saw from the demo, we actually asked some more questions. We asked them six questions. Um, this constitutes one block, and with three blocks, you get a hit, and per hit, we compensate 90 cents. And participants can do this work multiple times. So as an output, we were able to collect around 12,000 gaze maps. Well, our expectation of the um, collection was around 30 days. It actually took more than that. It took more than 50 days. And we also conducted some sanity check to make sure that participants were concentrating during the experiment. And for that, out of the six images, we had a dummy image. All of them were bar charts. And we've, if, one of, if that dummy is correct, we treated all of them, all of the images in the block, to be correct. Um, and the success hit rate was 71%. And now we have the data, we have the gaze. We need, it to pro we need to find an optimal way to choose the model. And so for this, we had two criteria. First, that the model must be computationally fast and efficient. Second, at the same time, it must be able to provide accurate performance. And for that, we devised an encoder-decoder architecture called SimpleLet. And we set Kulbeck library divergence as um, the objective function and we only use correctly, lab correctly answered labels. 
However, in conducting the experiment, we, uh, sorry, in training the model, we had some issues. The issues was that there were some, ga there were some noise and gaze dots caused by um, lighting issues or um, some subtle movement of the hair and so on, and they actually hindered the training process. So the solution we took here was actually to remove gaze dots in areas with no image stimuli. For example, uh, so you see this area here, there are gaze dots, but they don't have image stimuli. And while we should have um, used this transformed heat map to train the model, in fact, as you see here, we actually removed gaze information in this area to train the model. Yes. Now it's time to e present evaluation of our scanner deeply. I want to talk briefly about the quantitative evaluation of scanner deeply. Um, we compared our work with scanner deeply that did not have noise removed, and um, the silicon there represents the same neural net used with silicon data set. Silicon data set is also gaze data set, but therefore natural images, and DVS model is a gaze prediction model for visualization that puts special emphasis on um, textual information, and they aim for a general purpose model. And our evaluation shows that our, our work is slight, we're slightly better than the three of them. However, the metrics we, we show here and the metrics we present in the paper were actually optimized for uh, analyzing gaze on computer vision techniques but they're not necessarily optimized for analyzing gaze in um, visualizations. Um, so it is possible that the metrics that we used may be imperfect. And now I want to talk about the qualitative characteristics of Scanner Deeply, which is quite test specific. First, Scanner Deeply focuses more on the structure of charts but actually this makes sense because what the, the task we asked for this experiment was to figure out what chart it was, and looking at the structure would actually help more than looking at the title or text, text information. Um, secondly, Scanner Deeply does not always prioritize text. Actually, this is in contrast to what our keynote speaker said about textual information and visualizations. Um, however, we think that this is actually possible in, in our case because our case was a seven second quick overview study. And in such circumstances, we think that text can be less important than other features. And lastly, Scanner Deeply is capable of prioritizing low level features when needed. For example, um, if you look at this chart here, there is um, this white colored bar that is intentionally colored white so that we could focus our salience on this place. And while Scanner Deeply can um, provide more a lot of salience in these areas, other models such as DVS or Silicon um, diverse, the, diverse their attention to titles or ticks and legends. Now, here's our takeaways. So we proposed a neural, gate, neural net gaze prediction model on visualizations. And our model provides interesting results that are affected by the task we conducted. Thank you very much. And don't forget, uh, we're disclosing our data set. And the data set can be found in this QR code. Thank you very much. Thank you for that talk, Sung Mark. We have a, a few questions. We'll start with something that's near and dear to my heart, which is visualization literacy. So did you collect any information about the literacy of your participants? Essentially, how familiar they are with that chart type, right? So the eye tracking patterns would be different for someone who'd never seen that or someone who was more familiar with that. Oh, you're right. I think that's a very good question. In fact, we didn't explain, um, sorry, we didn't explain um, in, in this presentation, um, so, we did not really have very, um, we didn't test about different literacy, but we set some constraints about this, that, um, that uh, people should be able to know some basic facts about visualization, such as bar chart or line charts. We actually added that in our constraints when recruiting participants. However, we did not really specifically test on them, so I think that that's also a very interesting area of research. And it would be interesting to see how deep neural networks can actually learn those differences. Thank you. 
Okay, and then one quick question in the interest of time, and then the, the rest you can find on Slido, which is, did you compare your results with measurements of in-lab studies, for example, with webcaster.js? In lab, in lab studies, like person, people coming into a lab and actually having their gaze measured. Um, um, we weren't able to do that. Well, we wanted to do that. However, we actually conduct this during times of COVID, and it was really physically not possible to do so. But I think I really wanted to test using eye trackers. It's just because of our physical situation that we weren't able to do. It's a I'm very sorry. valid answer. Thank you so much. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. And for the last talk of today's session, let us welcome Ameya Patil, who will be talking about studying early decision making with progressive bar charts. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Ameya Patil, PhD student at the University of Washington, Seattle, and I'll be talking about a work on studying early decision making with progressive bar charts. This work is in collaboration with Gail Richer, Christopher Jamin, Dominic Moritz, and Jean-Daniel Fekit. Progressive visualizations have become popular for data analysis in numerous domains, owing to the ability that it gives to its users to make early decisions. These visualizations work by visualizing small samples of the data in a cumulative manner which enables the user to start analyzing the data as soon as possible. I believe most of you would have seen examples like these uh, in the bottom right corner over here. During elections, they give us a good idea of which candidate will win way beforehand as the votes are being counted in real time. However, making early decisions is not that easy. It comes with its own problems. And to understand the problem better, let us look at another example. Here we have a bar chart showing the mean estimate of two data sets, A and B, progressively. Note that the bars are changing as new progressive updates are received. Now the question is, when can we answer which among A or B has a higher mean value? As can be seen here, our answer may vary based on when we choose to answer. Incorrect decisions may be made based on a limited number of data points. And essentially, the user has to trade off between accuracy and time, that is, wait more to make a correct or a more reliable decision. Now to help alleviate this problem, confidence intervals have also been used in progressive visualizations. But exactly how fast and accurate are humans when making these, when using these existing designs? To answer this question, we studied early decision making for progressive bar charts using these designs. The first, baseline, the simple bar chart. Second, CI, the bar chart with 95% confidence intervals. Our second research question was to find out how different progressive bar charts affect human performance. Accordingly, we created the near history based visualizations which visualize the last n progressive estimates with or without confidence intervals. So the baseline and CI designs, uh, the bars and confidence intervals show only the latest progressive estimate. While for the near history designs, we show the last n estimates, where the la latest estimate appears on the right side of each category with full opacity, as the older estimates shift to the left with decreasing opacity. Now the idea behind explicitly visualizing near history is to offload the cognitive task of tracking the stability of the estimates where instability indicates non-convergence to the true value, and it can hint the user towards waiting more before making a decision. We studied these four designs in our experiment. We performed a crowdsource study to understand user performance in the progressive setting, and to evaluate the four progressive bar chart designs. Our participants were shown bar charts like these, where each bar represents the mean value of a data set loaded progressively. And we consider the value comparison task. So our participants were asked questions like, is the mean value of A greater than that of B? Each progression lasts for 120 seconds, within which the participants are supposed to answer. We evaluate user performance using the response time and the accuracy of their answers. That is, how often the users answered correctly during the entire study. And correct answers are defined based on the relationship between the means computed over the full data set. We evaluate the visualization designs using a subjective confidence rating asked for each design after answering all the tasks. 
It is a measure of how confident the participants felt while answering the tasks using each of the four designs. Now, to create tasks with varying levels of complexity, we considered three different realistic data distributions having different convergence behaviors. Our hypothesis was that it would affect user performance in different ways. So it was normal distribution, which has a well-defined mean, power law distribution, which may or may not have a well-defined mean, and data generated using the Wonder join algorithm for the join operation in databases. So Wonder join is a progressive join algorithm which tries to produce samples representative of the true data, but again, it is subject to the irregularities of, the, of any approximate query answering technique. So the top row shows the progressive bar charts visualizing the mean estimate for two data sets A and B drawn from the same distribution. And the line chart in the second row shows how the mean estimate and the confidence interval converges over time. Um, so based on the fluctuations in the confidence in, in the convergence profiles, we can see how answering tasks on the normal distribution may seem relatively easier than on the power law distribution, which in turn may seem relatively easier than on the wonder joint data. So we can expect a corresponding trend in performance in, hum in human performance as well. Here is a walkthrough of some examples of the tasks that our participants performed. We asked our participants to answer two questions on each page for a total of 48 questions. We instructed them to perform the tasks as quickly but as accurately as possible. On clicking the Start button, the bar charts are updated once per second, and the participants can answer either question first by clicking on any of the corresponding two blue buttons. We provide immediate feedback for the correctness of the answer, and also show the accuracy so far in the study in an accuracy bar at the bottom. And we also inform them of a bonus for accuracy above 50%. All this was done to push our participants towards focusing more on accuracy rather than rushing through the tasks. So the progression lasts for 120 seconds, but the participants can move on to the next page as soon as both the questions on a page are answered. After answering all the tasks, we have to ask the participants to rate each visualization based on how confident they felt while using them. We also ask them to provide a verbal explanation for the rating to get more insights. So from our study, we found that our participants performed value comparison tasks fairly accurately and quickly, regardless of the visualization design. So across all data sets and across all designs, we report an average accuracy of 92% and an average response time of 22 seconds, which represents around 18% of the data. This answers our first research question and indicates that humans are equipped with the cognitive ability to understand progressive processes. Talking about the performances on individual designs, uh, we found that humans, our participants performed better on the CI and history designs compared to the baseline and history CI designs although not all the differences were significant. We report a 2% higher accuracy and a 2 second shorter response time for the CI and history designs compared to the other two, Z, other two designs. And we can expect these differences to be more evident on real life progressive systems, which may have longer progressions or more distracting interfaces. Finally, we report that the history and history CI designs enjoy a higher confidence rating compared to the baseline and CI designs, in spite of the high learning curve involved in using near history visualizations, as mentioned by some of our participants. And this answers our second research question. See, confidence intervals and near history can improve user performance, and that near history has potential to be used in progressive visualizations. As an exploratory experiment, we also studied human performance in comparison to those of automated decision procedures to get an idea of how the benchmark optimal performance looks like in the progressive setting. Since decision making in the progressive setting is a trade off between accuracy and time, we wanted to find out how the Pareto optimal frontier looks like in this case, and where do humans lie relative to this curve. Since we used three different data distributions, and to our surprise, we could not find a distribution independent optimal decision procedure, we chose three procedures as a proxy for the optimal performance the confidence intervals procedure, t test, and the generalized likelihood ratio test, or GLRT. We fed these procedures with the same progressive data samples as were used in our user study and recorded the response time and accuracy of these procedures. And here are the results. Uh, we have the accuracy on the y-axis and response time on the x-axis. And we would like to be somewhere in the top left corner of the plot uh, that is low on, low on response time and high on accuracy. So we found that human performance is better than the CI procedure, but not as good, but very close to the other two decision procedures. So across all data sets, the t-test could achieve 92% accuracy, the same as humans, in just six seconds, while GLRT was more conservative, achieving 97% accuracy in the same time as humans, that is 22 seconds. The confidence intervals procedure answered within three seconds on an average, but with an accuracy close to random guessing. 
These procedures are still heuristics that make assumptions on the data distribution. So there are no guarantees on their optimality. But we can see that humans are not very far from this Pareto optimal frontier, which supports our finding that humans are good at decision making in the progressive setting. So to summarize, we found that humans seem to be equipped with the cognitive ability to understand progressive processes. Humans can be fast and accurate in making early decisions using progressive visualizations. In asserting the 92% accurate using only 18% of the data. Near history and confidence intervals can improve user performance. And that near history has the potential to be used in other chart types like scatter plots and gradient plots, in spite of the higher learning curve. Our study data is available on OSF. And for more details, I invite you all to read our paper. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Amaya. So one question we have here is whether you plan on extending the study to other chart types. So what other chart types might be easier for users to infer from? Yeah, this was a pretty common uh, question we got from most of our feedbacks as well. I guess we'll have to define what uh, different classes of chart types that we can test this uh, near history technique on. Uh, scatter plots is one very common thing. We also got questions about gradient plots, which is very common as a replacement for bar charts. So that is something that we also want to look into uh, in the future. Yeah. That's great. And then just to wrap up, do you think that there is a quantifiable measure for human performance based on what you conclude that humans are good in decision making using these kind of progressive bar charts? Yeah. So again, as I said, uh, it's basically trade off between accuracy and time. And we were trying to basically focus on how accurate humans are when we formed our hypothesis for this experiment. So based on previous experiments on human performance on static bar charts and a little bit on progressive visualizations, we set our threshold to around 80%. And we found that humans were way beyond that 92% accuracy and just using one fifth of the data. So yeah, we can also choose certain kind of thresholds depending on the context for different use cases, but this is what we chose. Fantastic. Let's thank Amaya and all of our speakers today. Thank you all for coming and have a great lunch.